Tracy Adler, the Johnson Poe director of the Welland Museum of Art here at Hamilton College. I'm thrilled to be joined by our upcoming exhibiting artist, Yeshua Kloss. Um, uh, Yeshua and I are gonna talk about the exhibition for about 30 minutes and then we'll take questions at the end. So please feel free to put questions in the chat. Alexander Jarman, our assistant curator will be monitoring the chat and then he will join us after, um, after Yeshua's presentation, our little discussion and ask some questions. Um, just by way of an introduction, Yeshua Kloss, our labor, Marcy Artist's first solo museum exhibition and features all new print-based and sculptural work created specifically for the exhibition. It'll be on view here from February 12th through June 12th. I'm also pleased to share the brand new news that Yeshua is now represented by Sikkima Jenkins in New York. They just announced that on Monday. And much of the work in this show will actually travel to the gallery and be on view at Sikkim Jenkins in the fall. So that's like hot off the presses, big news. Um, so how did this exhibition arise? Uh, Yeshua and I met when he was an MFA student at Hunter College and I was the curator of the Hunter College Art Galleries probably about 15 years ago now. And in 2017, we acquired a beautiful work of his for the Wellens collection. And over lunch in New York one day, Yeshua and I were talking about doing a show together, uh, collaborating on an exhibition here at the Wellen. And um, he mentioned some recent life changes, which he is going to discuss in his presentation. And we, we talked about, hey, that could be a really cool thing to, uh, to address in, in the exhibition. Um, so it's been a really fruitful and wonderful collaboration working together. And um, I'm just so happy that Yeshu and I, after all these years, we are still connected and that we're able to support his growth as an artist. Um, another facet of the show is also Yeshu is gonna be collaborating with a group of our Hamilton students to create a site specific uh, print-based collage mural, a 24-foot mural. So we're really excited about that. We're going to have students working with him in January. Um, and that was made possible by a grant from the Dan Daniel Dietrich uh, Fund for Innovation in the Arts. So I just want to shout out to that. Uh, just a little background. Yeshua was born and raised in Chicago and lives and works in New York City. Um, his work has been featured in solo gallery shows in Paris, uh, New York, and LA. And he's been in group exhibitions at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles, at Goodman Gallery in Johannesburg, and the International Print uh, Center and the Studio Museum, both in New York City. Uh, his work is included in the collection of the Kalamazoo Institute of the Arts, uh, the Pizzuti Collection, the Seattle Art Museum, and of course, the Welling Collection. Um, he's been awarded residencies at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, Brick, which is in Brooklyn, Skowhegan um, School of Painting and Sculpture, the Joan Mitchell Center, and the Vermont Studio Center. He is the recipient of the 2014 Joan Mitchell Foundation Grant and a 2015 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship. He earned his MFA at Hunter College, like we talked about, um, and a BFA from uh, Northern Illinois University. He is represented by Sycama, uh, which is brand new news, and also recently uh, taken on as an artist with the gallery, which I'm, I know I'm going to mis, mispronounce their name in Luxembourg. Zidun, Zidun Boisset. Thank you, because you yeah. saved me there. <laughs> so Yeshu is going to talk to us a little bit about the conceptual underpinnings for this exhibition, and then we're excited about being in dialogue with all of you. So I'm going to, uh, I'm thrilled to introduce Yeshua. Oh, wow. Firstly, thank you so much, Tracy, for that warm uh, welcome, and I want to say welcome to all the alum here and everyone joining us. Um, and before I begin, Tracy, I do want to just acknowledge the, the care that you've given to me in this process, because it has really been important when I discussed this kind of life-changing uh, moment with you, I felt no pressure from you to pursue it as this show. And I think it was in that moment that I knew this was the safe space to experiment, to explore, and to push these ideas. So 
Uh, it gives me I, uh, just great honor to be able to share my research with, with Tracy and, and everyone uh, on the staff at the Welling who has been so gracious um, in providing me the support and space to do this. So uh, I'm honored, thank you very much. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm excited to share with you this journey that I'm on and talk about our labor, the show at the Welling. I believe the best way to do this and I'm going to screen share now. So my head is gonna get tiny, but the work will get large. And I think that my intentions today, what I would like to do is give you a little bit of an idea of me, what, what has sort of made me a creative and an artist and the way, that I, the way that I think and sort of process the world. And then also walk you through the process that I have been making work up until this life-changing event, which I'll discuss. And then of course, that life-changing event leading to this show, Our Labor at the Welling. So I'm Yeshua, this is a photo of me at seven years old. Um, I'm not showing this photo because it's cute. It is adorable, but that, that's sort of a matter of fact. There's a bigger reason here. Uh, this backyard that I'm in pops up later on. So please recall this space because the work that I'm gonna discuss in this, this life-changing event, it started here. I saw this photo for the first time only three years ago. So again, in the photo, I'm seven years old, been estranged from a part of my family, which I'll get into. And I saw this photo only recently. So I'm raised on the South side of Chicago and I've done a lot of teaching uh, at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Parsons in Manhattan, and of course, Hunter College, my alma mater, where I met Tracy once, once, not too long ago, let's say. Uh, being raised by a single parent mom as an only child on the South Side of Chicago, my work has always been about family. Aren't our identities, our ideas of identity constructed in community and built from these materials of our environments. These are the questions that I'm thinking about. I've actually always been uh, considering that in my work. Because I didn't have much family growing up, my friends and neighbors became my siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins. I understood family as the people who we survive with and the people we survive for. I make images of this family and their resilience. So apologies, we have run into my first uh, technical difficulty in trying to forward the screen, but here we are. So this is me surrounded by these images. And again, this is work that has led me to the work that I'll show later. But what's important here is that the faces you're seeing are certainly not singular individuals, right? These are composites. So the fragmentation of collage allows me to discuss this idea of identity as one that is formed in community, one that is formed uh, with the family that nurtures us, with our neighbors, with our loved ones, with the people we survive with and for. So you're seeing images of survival tactics. These heads, these identities are sort of confronting these plain structures, these grids, which I'll talk more about in a moment. I'm sort of like a sculptor building from the inside out. I really love this image because you're seeing a lot of dimensionality, right? I'm trying to talk about this illusionistic depth, this space that appears to be three-dimensional. It appears as though we're seeing bricks, two by fours, concrete, and this head form, this very sculptural form, but it's more or less 2D, it's flat. Uh, but this illusion is important to me because again, I'm thinking about the way that we project ourselves into the world, you know, a sort of, a, a sort of space that is a really maybe made from uh, practical materials in our real lived environment, but it's also imagined, right? An identity that is also uh, imagined and proposed. So a little bit about the process of how do I get here? I'm trying to find any possible way that I can draw using printmaking materials. Drawing lays the foundation for the carved lines. So here I'm tracing 
a projected image onto a piece of wood. This is MDF wood. And you see the drawing there on the wood. The drawing leads me to the carving process. Now I use MDF wood in particular and linoleum because there's no wood grain. So with woodblock printing, I can carve that line in circular and, and, and circular uh, forms without, without hitting a point where the wood grain resists as it goes in only one direction. Woodblock printing allows me to carve into a block of wood and then print the surface that remains. So it's almost a recording of the kinetic gesture that I'm making with the wood. So carving into the wood is a physical act. I find it myself very akin to drawing. It's in a way the same arm motion, uh, but of course you're dealing with the material a bit differently than drawing. The next step in that process is inking. So inking allows me to create prints of varied saturation. Everything uncarved, remains on the surface of the block to be inked. So in the image there in the bottom right, you see me rolling out ink on top of the carved image. So therefore everything that does not get carved, does not get removed from the block, remains on the surface and gets inked. And that's why we call woodblock relief block printing as well. You may have heard that term. Here in the printing process, I love using hand pressure in printing because it becomes democratic in that way. It's a way of removing the limitations and expectations of the process. What I mean by that is that in traditional printmaking, a printmaker may run this block through a printing press, right? This is a, a high pressure roller that rolls over the block uniformly of uh, having pressure throughout the block. When I do this by hand, I get to vary where the pressure goes and where to let up a little bit. So that's what I mean by democratically. I can make decisions also in the print process and I feel a, a little bit more in control of, uh, of the results that way. Uh, so that's the printing. I use hand pressure and in the bottom right corner, you're seeing all of these swatches that I put on the wall where I've rolled out ink from the roller directly onto the paper. So in printmaking, printmaking lingo, we would call that monoprinting or monotyping. And this leads us to the glorious mess that I make. <laughs> and I think that, that that mess is often referred to as collage. Uh, you see me there, uh, this is funny. This photo, this first upper left photo is kind of funny to me because I feel like kind of like an animal in his habitat there, um, almost sort of like a chameleon that's in the, in the environment that, that I love the most. So unlike traditional collage, you see me making my own source material. I need to see all of my options. This is just kind of how my mind is working. So while they're, they're tacked and pinned up on the wall, uh, then they eventually get scattered around the studio and I'm cutting and I'm I'm, I'm sorting through a pile of chaos in order to find order. So cutting and assembly from the printed materials. And when this happens, I can end up with something as succinct as this brick that's in front of us, right? So that a brick like that, that you're looking at in that example, it might be composed of like seven pieces of paper, um, but it, it, it's the mono printing, and it's the cutting and collaging that gets me to arrive at uh, that, that kind of illusionistic depth that I like so much. And of course, the collage process. So once I've got my blocks uh, drawn, carved, inked, printed, now I'm taking the, some of those images, I'm tacking them to the wall, and now we're collaging, right? I'm, I'm configuring the relationship between these, uh, between these different elements. And here you'll notice uh, the, the wrinkles and the waves in the print, that's because these are printed on muslin. So the muslin then gets attached to the unstretched canvas. So this is the finished work here. And the texture that you're seeing is also uh, Japanese rice paper, as I'm also thinking about the lineage of printmaking, right? So, again, in a sort of a, a looser, broader sense and considering family, I'm thinking about the lineage in my sort of creative DNA, if you will. That is the, the heroes and the, and, the, and the artists that I uh, 
kind of assume uh, as, as, as part of my own um, family and my own identity, <clears throat> but I'm very inspired by uh, Hokusai and Hiroshi J. So the Japanese rice paper continues to come up. So what is, what is this work about at this point, right? So again, we're thinking about Chicago, the urban planning was designed for segregation to separate black and white. That's baked into the planning and geography of the city. When we talk about Chicago, we talk about it being on a grid, named streets intersecting numbered streets. In art history, the grid is a kind of tool for optical democracy. There's no visual hierarchy in a grid. You can enter any space at any time. I'm interested in the grid's proposal of democracy and how that's failed black folks given where I'm from and how Chicago is constructed. To some degree, I consider the grid an obstacle that has pressured black people to persist. And I should say also resist is another word that I like to add onto the end of that. Again, you're seeing these identities sort of tangling with injustice. That grid is meant to confine and define identity. But our identities as people, of course, they persist and resist beyond any categories. So you're seeing a lot of that, that tension there in the work. And speaking of survival, much of the work pays homage to survival tactics. A lot of the heads and faces look like sculptural forms. They suggest that they're built, that they're constructed of wood, brick, rock, cinder block. These are the elements of the urban environment. These are the leftover relics after a city is built. And I like to think about Chicago. Often when we mention Chicago, we think about this history of great architecture in Chicago. Mies van der Rohe, Frank Lloyd Wright, who I'm of course, you know, a super fan of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but what happens is with the segregation of Chicago, of course, that kind of architecture is relegated to a certain part of the city, right? So the, the rest of the city gets functional architecture and then the leftovers of that, the detritus of that architecture are the cinder blocks, the concrete, the, the, the two by fours, these kind of elements that I'm interested in, what happens in the margins, what kind of, what kind of uh, identities are we building in these margins? So here is, a, uh, is an image of me working on a form that was a breakthrough in my process. Up to this point, you've seen a lot of kind of uh, hard edge geometric forms things that are very heavy in weight uh, when we think about cinder blocks or, or wood, but this is a form of a rose, right? And this was a challenge to me, just formally. I thought, you know, I've been dealing with these uh, in a way decidedly masculine forms and then considering, uh, you know, again, architecture of Mies van der Rohe and uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but the, the, the floral form offered a departure from that and a challenge. And of course, this is one that grows from nature. It's not man-made. So again, I'm interpreting this form and seeing how can, I, how can I discuss all these things that I've been thinking about, about identity and environment, uh, using this, this form as a symbol of, of beauty in nature. And you'll see it recur along with this hand form, which in a second, I'll zoom out. We can talk more about the hand or you can actually see it in context. So the thing about the hand in particular that I'm interested in is how do I pay tribute to the invisible labor black folks have done in building this country and at the same time undermine expectations of the black body as a body that's designed for labor, right? So here you see the hand holding the flower. And if you look closely, there are those elements of the built environment, you have bricks, but they're kind of falling away, right? The hand is really more curious or more interested in this kind of nurturing gesture and holding the flowers, the, the vines, this sort of wildlife form. And here's another hand. This one is dealing with these uh, forms that kind of maybe remind us of gems or crystals, right? So I'm thinking about value. And again, crystals are uh, certainly, uh, something that has been filtered through capitalism as, as, a, as a, its own different value, but it comes from the earth also, right? This is a naturally forming 
uh, element as well. So again, you see these two by fours, uh, some rocks and things like that, but they're falling away, right? This is that the hand is aware of them and it's of the same world as them, but it's really more interested in, in what might be a different value system. And that brings us to our labor. So this was a pivotal uh, turning point for me. I was at my computer. I got a Facebook message, which I'll read aloud here because it's a bit small. It says, hi, Yeshua. My name is Paige White. My family and I, Massey McDonald, recently did an ancestry DNA search under my uncle Timothy Massey McDonald. And you came up as a pretty strong match, either a cousin or nephew. I would love to see how we could be connected. We have a ton of relatives in Chicago and you actually favor some of my family here in Detroit. I look forward to hearing from you, best Paige. And then I replied, Paige, my dad is a McDonald, Leon. His family was also Massey's. Let's try to connect the dots. Now I know I sound very cool and calm with this response, but believe me, my, my brain exploded. I paced back and forth and I, I really had to uh, take some deep breaths and kind of understand what this, what this could mean for me. What did it mean? Was it real? <laughs> I had never got a message like this and I didn't grow up with any contacts on this side of the family. So I met my father twice in my life. And the first time I met him, he took me to Detroit where that first image was, uh, that first photo that I began the presentation with was taken when I was seven years old and I was in this same backyard here. So this is me with uh, a, a small part of, uh, of my family. Uh, this was taken very recently at uh, my aunt's birthday. That's my aunt next to me who I'm hugging. And that's the, that's the same backyard that was in that photo when I was seven years old. So needless to say, I mean, my mind is still blown. I'm still sort of wrapping my, wrapping my head around uh, what all this means and, and what it means to be a part of this very loving, and generous, welcoming family. They're, we're all working so hard to, to play catch up. Um, but again, being an only child um, and then all of a sudden I'm an uncle, a nephew, a cousin, and uh, I, ha I have this big loving family. So on my second visit to see the family in Detroit, uh, I took a little side trip to the DIA, Detroit Art uh, Institute of Art. This is Diego Rivera's 1933 masterpiece, which is a fresco installed there. It is called the Detroit Industry Mural and is of course a tribute to uh, what was the heartbeat of the American economy at that time, the auto plant. Ford, the Ford family commissioned Diego Rivera to produce this mural. You'll notice all of the workers heads are down they're pretty much faceless, all white male. There's a few actually uh, black and brown figures, but that was a diversity move on Diego's behalf, which he was uh, applauded for. Uh, being historically accurate, it was white men working at the factory here in Detroit, 1933. Uh, and the only real faces that you'll see, the only portraits you'll see are of course, of those who commission the painting, that's the Ford family. You'll see them uh, all the way to the right corner of this mural. So I saw this mural and I thought, I thought about it as a kind of Sistine Chapel of the Midwest, uh, maybe as ironic as that sounds, but it's gorgeous. And I haven't seen the Sistine Chapel in real life, but those, who I, those whose opinions I respect have, have said, this is, this is even more magnificent than the Sistine Chapel. Um, so there's, there's something about the detail, the commitment that Diego is putting into this. Of course, Diego Rivera being a communist himself, he was really interested in the worker as a proletariat. The worker is a part of a cog in the wheel for the, the higher cause, right? Which is, which is the, the culture, the community. So it struck me maybe three months after seeing this mural, that maybe this mural would be a structure for my family tree. Now, I have been trying to wrap my head around my grandmother having 15 children, okay? 
and how my dad, one of those children, and all of these aunties and uncles and cousins and nephews I had, but I had been writing these names down on a piece of paper, drawing arrows and circling and writing little stories and notes. But I'm a visual thinker, right? I process the world through the, the, compli the complicated world and, and, and things that I'm interested in through, through my art. So I decided making a map was the best idea. The drawing you see beneath uh, Diego's reproduction, this is the first sketch that I did to try to think about family tree. So of course you see this tree sprouting through the center of the drawing, kind of sprawling through the background. Right there in the center of the tree, there's a, a drawing of, of my grandma. She's dropping the motor. And then above her to the top left, there are five figures, which are the first McDonald's. My dad is one. And then in the center, there's nine figures. Grandma remarried and had the Masseys. And then at the very top right, there's Paul Green, 15 kids total. At the bottom, the plant floor, that's all of the offspring. So that's the first cousins, that's uh, some of my nieces, um, and, and uh, yeah, it's mainly cousins, and there's a self-portrait snuck in there. So as I'm thinking about factory, someone I heard recently used the metaphor, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. So I'm considering, I'm considering how do I tackle making a project that kind of uh, implicates Diego's scale and his commitment, right? And how do I produce the, all of these factory components? So printmaking makes a lot of sense. I can carve a block of wood, I have a master copy, and I can print it as many times as I want. Now that's important because in the factory, there's gonna be a lot of repeating shapes and forms. There's a lot of circles, there's a lot of uh, car parts, a lot of wheels, pipes that repeat themselves. So I can carve it out of wood once and continue to print it as many times as I need. So you're looking at here, the blocks of wood that uh, have been carved to be printed to make the factory. In doing so, I also found myself sort of repeating the, the repetitious labor of, of plant work. Right, so in some ways, I'm I'm finding myself kind myself kind of immersed in a, a little bit of the the contemporary labor history that uh, I'm, I'm tracking my family through. And I should also say, my family moved from Memphis to Detroit in order to secure jobs at the auto plant. And uh, like many Black families during the the Great Migration that was access to the American dream for black folks at the time. There was the promise of middle class. Uh, at that time, one could even buy a home, work in a plant, have somewhat of a middle class existence. Of course, those times have changed as uh, capitalism stays, stays loyal, not for too long. And those jobs uh, have been shipped out. A lot of the auto plants in Detroit have shut down, which we'll discuss in a moment. So here's a close up of me working on that large mural, which I'm basing off Diego Rivera's structure. And these are portraits of family members uh, that are inside the mural. In fact, in that uh, bottom right square, you see me attaching Paige, who is again, the cousin that initially reached out uh, to contact me. And here's an image of the large mural. It's deceptively tiny here on your screen, but this is 15 feet tall by 40 feet wide. Um, so I was very lucky that the Welland Museum has a wall for this mural. Uh, and that's not to be taken for granted. There's not many walls that can handle a work this size. If you look close, uh, not only will you see all of these portraits of family members, but you'll see some of that sprawling wildlife that I talked about. Some of those flowers uh, that are wrapping around factory instruments, some of those weeds and vines growing through there. Those abandoned factories I've, I'm, I'm finding in Detroit, they're often being reclaimed. I know that there's a word being used for Detroit as, as dilapidated or, or it's, you know, it's uh, falling apart or disarray, but I'm seeing something, a renewal occur actually. And I'm seeing uh, mother nature have her way. And I believe that there's, there's gonna be some amazing new regrowth there, right? And, and, and we're not being romantic about that either because that regrowth comes with uh, a lot of lost job opportunity and uh, of course, economic decline uh, for, for my family as well. 
This is Desiree holding a car door. So this is still within the same thinking, same body of work. Uh, this is my niece, Desiree, and she's holding this uh, stylized car door. And again, you're seeing those vines, weeds and wildflowers wrapping around there. There's also the presence there of some art deco. So as I mentioned, I'm a big architecture fanatic, right? And I've been thinking about a way to, uh, how, how, do I, how do I inject uh, art deco into my work? And I hadn't had a reason until I had visited Detroit and walked around and saw some of these buildings which, uh, which, which have this amazing art deco design and wall sconces and some stained glass windows. And I thought about art deco as this sort of promising design for like the sleek futuristic industrial big city, right? And in a way how that, how that has disappointed uh, black folks in Detroit, because of course we know that Detroit is in, is in trouble now. Economically speaking, the mayor has said as much himself. So other works uh, in this show where, where I'm really finding some connectivity to my own identity and my own past. Now in that message from Paige, she mentioned a DNA search. I did a DNA test through ancestry.com to get closer to my African roots. I didn't do it in order to find family. That was something that, that happened, right? I didn't expect that outcome. So what you're seeing here is a kind of collapse of time. I'm thinking about uh, my African roots. So you see the African tribal mass. These, these are the roots that I was searching for originally. And then you see the sort of tribe that I landed on, which is my family in Detroit who worked at the auto plant. So that mask uh, behind the African mask is the welder's mask. And what interests me about that is how the welder's mask hides identity, right? It's meant just to protect the laborer. Nothing, nothing stylistic about it. It's really just a utilitarian. That African tribal mask on the other hand is meant to call forth uh, ancestors and uh, other characteristics to imbue the wearer with a certain strength and character. So I'm interested in uh, these very different proposals of how to access identity and if those two things can kind of exist in the same form. This is what I'm curious about. Uh, down there in the bottom right, that's Auntie Grandma. That's a sculpture that's also in the Our Labor Show. Forgive the image. This is uh, not at the well, and this, this background uh, was during the process, but the sculpture remains pretty much the same. There is an added uh, self-portrait attached to this. So there are, right now you're looking at 15 branches as my grandmother had 15 children and that's a, a Ford motor made the year I was born. But the self-portrait is the final branch that I've attached to one of those branches, uh, which represents myself. And that I got from the Glen on Hamilton's campus. So uh, I, I really like that as a kind of like, up the very most uh, recent update to my journey uh, since discovering my family, leading me all the way to this show and to Hamilton's campus and, and finding that little, uh, that stick as a self-portrait, which I've added lastly. And here's a close-up of a welding mask mixed with a, a Keith Webe tribal mask. I'm also torching that you're seeing some of the charred parts of these masks. So I'm torching them in order to activate them with my own creative labor, right? Because again, I'm thinking about labor and I'm thinking about how these, these uh, traditional, uh, traditionally African tribal masks are activated through a dance ceremony. And while I don't, and I've been disconnected from knowing and understanding that ceremony, but my ceremony is uh, through this sort of uh, fire. Maybe the fire is a kind of baptism uh, or a fusing, it's a way uh, for me to kind of alter uh, these forms and also kind of uh, activate them through my own ritual, which I do on my Brooklyn rooftop. I love this. And I believe that that brings me to the last slide. And I would love to share more, but... I I'm sure that we can have a, a rich discussion. Um, and just a note, 
Uh, that last sculpture that Yeshua showed is going to be acquired by the Wallen Museum. So we're really yes. thrilled about that as well. Um, so I know you and I have talked about this before, Yeshua, but uh, do you consider yourself a painter, a printmaker, or a sculptor? Yeah, I love, I love this question every time because mm -hmm. I never have a clear answer for it. But I think that squirming around with this question is the most fun, right? Because there's a bit of painting in the work. Uh, in fact, we saw that slide of me working on that, that rose form where I'm painting, but I'm painting with printmaking ink. So I'm not using acrylic or, or oil paint. So in that way, maybe I kind of slip past the category. Um, it's also a very small part of my work, painting. And as far as printmaking, most printmakers that I know are looking for, to, they're looking to remove any unpredictability from the print. So when they make a master copy, whether it's a litho plate, a lino block as I use, they want every edition printed to remain the same. I'm actually looking for all of the variants and the chaos. Um, and then the prints don't ultimately become the end product. They are then collage. So I think that eliminates me from printmaking in the strict sense of the, uh, of the word. Um, and, and sculpting, I, I, do, I do enjoy because I feel as though I'm building uh, a 3D space in a 2D confine. So I feel like I'm thinking like a sculptor, uh, however, I'm using paper. So maybe in some ways that eliminates me from uh, be, being a traditional sculptor as well. And that's a cool thing too, because, um, you know, I've known your work for so long and I know you did a couple of sculptures before, but in this show, sculpture plays a pretty big part. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, yeah, in that way, I'm certainly, uh, I, I think, I think the new sculptures uh, that I've made for our labor are certainly, that's certainly where I feel most like. I'm, I'm sculpting, right? Because those masks, and, and this is something that we talked about, Tracy, I could carve those masks from a piece of wood as those traditional tribal masks are. They're usually carved from one singular piece of wood. On the other hand, I'm approaching those more like I do my collage. I'm uh, cutting cubits of wood, stacking them up, adhering them together, almost like a topographical map and then I'm sanding those down, right? So I'm sort of going about that in a collage fashion as well. Yeah, I think that's from my, my love of playing with Legos as a child. And another cool thing that's really interesting is this kind of almost crossover between some of those scarification marks and the Art Deco motifs. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, I think it's so interesting, like when I've been telling my friends about this story of doing the DNA test, and then I tell them about the, the African countries that I'm related to, and I tell them that about my family in Detroit, and some people have asked me, so are you excited to go to Africa and, 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 and go to those countries and get connected? And I have to say, guys, I found my tribe. They're in Detroit. Right. And that's not to say that, uh, of course, I'm, I'm still interested and will eventually get to that part of the journey. But what I'm really excited about now is uh, th this th this family in Detroit. Right. Which is, uh, you know, in, to, to some degree is the kind of tribe that I relate to uh, the most right now. So I'm really, again, just considering uh, this search for identity. Uh, you know, and the sort of collapsing of like ancestral identity with my kind of more contemporary identity in the family. So yeah, in those masks, you see that that's that uh, reference to scarification as this art deco, which is all over the city of Detroit. Yeah. Okay, um, Alexander is going to join us now. Alexander Jarman is our assistant curator here at the Wallen, and he's been gathering some questions. So thank you. Jo thanks for joining us, Alexander. You want to hop into some questions? 
Yes, uh, I'm sure no one will be surprised. We have a lot of them for Yahshua, but I will I will actually start with um, one for both of you, um, which is a question about um, uh, sort of the editing process that you two go through when you're doing this show. So Yahshua, you started out even talking about like your studio is an editing process, right? Trying to figure out which images go together, but but what are, you know, what are sort of, how does the conversation go back and forth in terms of understanding um, what types of works are right for the show and right for the audience here at Hamilton and so forth? You know, I think I would love to hear Tracy's response on this because, you know, I think that Tracy, again, like I said at the beginning, she has such a soft hand with the way that she is. Um, editing and I think uh, influencing is certainly collaboration, but I have never felt uh, pressured in any way to to uh, you know move in any way around making or producing for this show. So I'd love to hear how, what her magic is and how, how she does it. But she certainly is uh, is the one who is uh, you know understanding sort of the larger picture here. And thank you, Yeshua. That's a really sweet. Well, I, I think part of it is uh, viewing a project uh, as a collaboration from the very beginning. And so, you know, everything that's in the show and even the design of the show, it's something that we've developed in tandem with Yeshua because we want it to be something that he feels really connects to the artwork itself. Um, we want him to have a wonderful experience working with us as much as we want to have a wonderful experience bringing the show to to our community and because there's so much that's interesting in in yeshua's work both historic with some of those historical references he talked about whether it's japanese prints identity or art deco architecture um, we already have a number of faculty who are super excited to bring their classes and to engage directly with yeshua and so, you know, knowing Yeshua's work for so long, I just knew he would be great for a teaching museum and great for the for the Well Museum. And we really want to foster artist creativity. And uh, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is his first solo museum show, so it's a big it's a big deal. And so we're really here to um, to to support Yeshua. And and yeah, I try to um, to really let the work lead the discussion and the artists lead the discussion. We're also gonna produce a publication, which will be uh, the first book of uh, critical work by Yesh around Yeshua's work, um, which will be uh, co-published with Delmonico Books, DAP. So that'll be after the show opens, but that's, a really another, that's another really exciting factor. But I guess it's just the collaborative aspect of it. I just look at everything, um, all the different steps as, as being part of the collaboration. Like we want, um, we want Yeshua to feel like this is a project, not just of his work, but really like from his heart. Um, thank you for your response to that. And again, if, if you do have a question, you can just, just put it in the chat directly to me, Alexander, and I'll put it in the queue. Um, a couple questions here for you, Yeshua, about uh, process. Um, so, especially given the the history of of woodblock printing, um, what how do you decide when to use color and and when to just leave things uh, black and white? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question because um, there are ways to use color in traditional woodblock printing that I resist doing. There, most woodblock printers, and again, if you think about the 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 Japanese um, process, they're layering blocks of color on top of one another. Now I, I don't work that way. I print in a color, and then I will um, hand touch or or brush and move the ink around while it's still wet in order to move the color. Uh, but I don't I don't ever at this point. Uh, print layers of color on top of one another. Um, but some of that is also because, again, when you saw that mural and the only color I'm using there is black, and there was a version of the mural, by the way, that I began that had color. And I worked on it for two days and it was going well, but I couldn't sleep. 
And the reason is because Diego did that already. He did a beautiful mural that was full color. He chose the colors. And I decided I wasn't trying to replicate what Diego did. I wanted to use his mural as a diagram for understanding my family and myself. So I reduced the color to black, to black and white. So color in that way was really a really, uh, a really practical decision. I was thinking more about uh, the, 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 the color and language of information sharing, right? And just trying to get down to what was the most important uh, in, the, in that case. So for me, uh, yeah, color, color has been a journey, but the, the most important uh, part is the form and concept and then color usually kind of follows uh, as, as a, as a compliment, but it's also, it's also a reference to the sort of, uh, faded, uh, faded architecture in some of these art deco structures I'm seeing. So there's not a whole lot of bold and bright, super rich color. The color is often sort of desaturated and almost more like a memory, right. Or more like, uh, some of the, some, some of that wear, wear and tear that I'm seeing. Um, we have a number of questions actually about the mural. Very, uh, people are very curious about this um, collaboration between you and the Hamilton students. Um, so um, Tracy and or Yashua, if you wanna comment on sort of how the idea to do that particular project within the exhibition came about, and um, I will tag sort of one other question onto the end of that, which is um, the idea of risk um, how do you embrace that, uh, Yashua, and how is that maybe even productive uh, for your art practice? Yeah, um, I, I, I know that, uh, you know, Tracy can speak to, to the student project um, because I know that, and this is something we talked about early on, that it's, it's it's an important part of the teaching museum. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm a teacher, uh, but I also enjoy this, the, the collaboration that's gonna happen uh, with the students there. Um, ri risk for me is, is super important. I mean, the risk for me is not knowing what's next in my making. So even though you saw that sketch of the mural, that's the most detailed preparatory work that I've ever done. Now I had to do it because it was such a large scale piece, right? Uh, so there was a lot of uh, planning out with proportion, but um, you saw me in the studio surrounded by uh, just the mess of the collage, which to me is where I like to place myself not knowing and figuring out along the way, this is the process. And I would just say in terms of the student project is, you know, we try when, when it's feasible, we try and give students the opportunity to work alongside artists. I think this is the fifth project where we've made that possible. And we just hear from our students what an irreplaceable experience that is. And it's, you know, the opportunity to, to work alongside an artist of your caliber, but also uh, even just the basics of understanding how to see a project through from conception through completion um, is really vital for them. And it's something that we hear again and again in terms of the feedback we get from our students, just what an enriching experience it is. And then it also, it's just really special. I mean, it's not something that has been that's being created for any other space than for here. So it also makes it into a really um, a unique experience. You have to come here to see it. Uh, when we did the site specific uh, uh, um, sculpture with Elias Sime, it was this huge monumental piece and it was a beautiful facet of the show. And it was wonderful for people to come and actually walk through this archway that the flower created into the show. So we try and create that, whether it's conceptually uh, possible or visually possible so that people really feel like they're engaged with the process and that they the, still the students have agency as well. And um, just a little clarification, um, Yeshua, can you just briefly describe um, sort of the, the medium and the, the format for this student mural? Yeah, sure. So uh, the, I think the, the, what I'm going to say is long winded. Okay. Let me warn you there. It's, 
it's it's a construction it's a collage construction of muslin prints attached to unstretched canvas there may or may not be japanese rice paper involved um but we will be we will be uh, printing from large blocks of wood. So those large blocks that I showed as part of the process in making the, the factory, the Ford auto plant in, in my mural, similar large blocks uh, we're shipping to the Welland. Students will ink up and print those blocks onto muslin. And then we'll also cut up those images and then reassemble them as part of this uh, large project. The student piece is big. It's 24 feet long and eight feet high. So I think, it, I think that if nothing else, it will give students an opportunity to, to work at a scale that maybe a lot of them have not tried yet. And we will, uh, we will have some documentation of the process of that mural being created that we will share with um, the public uh, as that's coming together. And um, also just want to say that entire project, the student mural project is only possible because of a Dietrich Inchworm grant. Um, so thank you to folks like Dean Keene, who are great advocates for us to um, be able to make use of those grants. Um, okay, so we have uh, some, some questions here that I'm going to say are about um, the intersection of the idea of sort of these floating and weightless uh, elements, these sort of untethered, ungrounded elements, and how that may or may not, for you, Yashua, um, be part of, you know, some conceptual or, or spiritual um, conceit uh, that you're trying to put into the work. Yeah, is that a question? I think I think it's a <laughs> question in form in the form of a statement that we'd love. To I love that. Elaborate on. <laughs> I mean, I, I I mean, I will say that that. Uh, Yes, um, the idea of, un I, I love the word untethered um, and I love the word floating. Untethered is to me interesting because when we think about heads, we know that heads are formed on bodies and if the body isn't present, then we have to consider violence or intention on the head being a representative of the body. I'm more interested in the latter because um, that my, the floating heads that I make are not about separation from body. They're about embodying identity on their own, right? The head as the seat of consciousness and also the idea of floating and untethering means that identity is also in flux and also moving and, and, in, a, and in a void, in a space that uh that 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 can be uh varied right because the environment is also inside of the identity <laughs> um you talked a little bit um in in terms of specific reference points for some of the building materials that um images of building materials that show up in your work um and we have a couple questions where folks are really interested in um the use of flowers and and plant life um and if that if you've um seen that in other genres or types of art and uh has that been influential for you um or is it just you know your obsession mm -hmm. with plants and let's mm -hmm. add flowers to that too yes. yeah and feathers flowers and yeah the, I, I would say for the feathers were even the precursor right for yeah. a lot of these uh floral forms and again, this goes back to the idea of untethering and floating because this is what feathers do. We know that they're separated from, from the, the animal that, or the, you know, the location that they're from, but they're, they also acknowledge the environment because they float and they inhabit negative space in a way. So I'm also using them in a very formal way as, in order to activate negative space because these sculptural forms are existing on blank planes, but the feathers help to acknowledge that as space as well. Um, my, my father, who I mentioned, uh, I met only two times in my life. Uh, while I have his DNA, uh, which I'm certain has led me to be an artist because it, it isn't from my mother. She's, uh, she's a teacher, but not an artist. So I got that part from her. He was a, a carpenter and a builder. So I grew up really wishing that I had his ability uh, as far as what I heard 
about his uh, his craftsmanship. So uh, because that wasn't a part of my upbringing, I think my work is again, a way to acknowledge some of that longing and some of that um, uh, estrangement through these building materials that, that he used and that were uh, you know, circulating throughout his life. So yeah, the, the flower forms uh, came about uh, again, as a, as a formal challenge. And then I, again, began uh, getting really excited when, when I would see this, what I would call rewilding of Detroit. So where Detroit as a city built on this, uh, you know, very wild and also partly marshland, and then that land reclaiming Detroit back. So that's happening. And then also there's a lot of uh, community farms happening now in Detroit. And so there's this, there's this nurturing of what's already there as opposed to what capitalism did with industry, remove that, level it, and then place uh, you know, man-made man buildings to, to build more stuff. Uh, so that, that's what I'm excited about. Art, art historically, I've been looking at a lot of uh, Autobahn uh, plant drawings and, and plant illustrations. Mm -hmm. Again, this is like, my woodblock printing interest, right? The line work, the detail, the illustration, the way of seeing those things in a way that's scientific and, and, and observation, but it's always subjective. Um, and I know we're, we're running out of time here, but- So maybe uh, one last question, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, I think I wanna go back to the masks because we have a, a couple of questions that have come in that all relate to the masks. Um, so, um, I guess I'll put it as um, in terms of which masks you've you've chosen so far to recreate. Um, did they come from uh, or uh, the the certain tribes that they came from? Is that anything in connection to the DNA ancestry search that you did, and or are there just other general influences um, from African art that have influenced you? Yeah, so that's a great question. I've long been excited about. Um, African art objects, especially um, through my interest and implication in my work towards abstraction, right? So we know that what we consider uh, abstraction in the Western context through art history, the uh, African tribal art has been doing that uh, successfully uh, long before it entered the, the Western canon. So the faces that I'm dealing with identity, they, they often sort of uh, implicate abstraction, though there's figuration you know, prominent there as well. The abstraction arrives through the distortion with the plane, through the fragmentation of identity, through the survival. And that way, blackness is uh, kind of alchemical and it is a, a, a material for survival. It can shape shift and find a way around, similar to those vines. Um, I've long been interested in African tribal art. Again, I'm grateful that I found a through line that kind of made sense with this, like, uh, this, this recent life-changing event and the new research that I'm doing. And I did begin, I did begin this, this, the, the mass making by relating it to, um, tribes that were West coast, uh, um, of Africa on the West, on, on the West side of the continent in order to, again, talk about that. But I'm actually starting to, to just explore further into, into the African continent uh, because I've long been inspired by uh, a lot of these traditions in mask making. Yeah, so it's not so literal. It's not a one-to-one -one as, you know, a lot of my uh, ancestry lands, uh, you know, in the Congo region, uh, you know, Nigeria. So I'm not just, I'm not just interested in that region, but also in also this the sort of trade and communication between regions throughout the continent. You talked a little bit. I loved that quote where you said the lineage in your creative DNA. Mm. Right. Which which to me, you know, that takes me, you know, to Hokusai and Hiroshi J and all the way up to, you know, Elizabeth Catlett. Um, who, who is to me, you know, my woodblock print hero. So um, I think as an artist, I have found my identity through my art 
And therefore my family members have been very vast in that sense. Yeah, you have some great family members then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would also just add that as part of the show, Yeshua has mined the Wellens collection and made some selections of artworks in our collection um, that will be on view in what we call the object study gallery in these uh, drawers that are open to visitors to, to look through. So that'll also give some kind of context for, uh, for Yeshua's work and some of the things and ideas and artists that he's been thinking about all this time. So I'm so grateful to you, Yeshua. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank, thank you. you all for joining us. Um, once again, this show opens February 12th and it'll be open till June 12th. So I hope that you'll come up during the run of the show um, and see it. It's gonna be fantastic. Uh, the work has been coming in. It's not all here yet, but it's been coming in and it's been really a joy to unpack and, and, uh, and to look at. It's really a fantastic work, so. Thank you so much for all your beautiful work, Yeshua. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this conversation. Tracy, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody at the Welland, Alexander, Christopher, Valerie, everybody. I mean, you have really helped facilitate something special here. Um, of course, I, you know, I came with sort of a seed, but I feel like you all made the soil fertile. And here we have this, this show, which I'm so proud of and so proud to, to be able to share it with you and everybody at the Welland. So thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Take care, happy holidays, and we'll see you in February. <laughs>